Hi everybody, I'm Betsy Billhorn and welcome to Under the Forelock where we're having interesting discussions with interesting horse people. And today I'm really honored to have Liz Conrad on the show. She's been a student of the horse for over 40 years uh, and uh, has dabbled in probably every, every little horse thing you've ever had, um, but really has been focusing on dressage. And today we're gonna talk about lunging. So Liz has been doing this for four decades um, and is really a big student of this and a big believer in lunging. And we're gonna to to go over what it is, what it isn't. Uh, I know there's a lot of confusion out there. Some people really think lunging is really great. Other people think it's useless and we're just making the horse go around in circle. Other people think it's damaging. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about that and then how it can be a useful tool in your practice. And then also the benefits of lunging, um, not only for the horse, but your relationship with the horse starting from the ground. So Liz, thank you very much for uh, being on the show. Really appreciate it today. So can you give people just a little bit of background on how you got into lunging? Because I know this isn't something that really, you know, today is taught right as part of your lesson or people just tend to do this as like, hey, you know, just, you know, get off the steam of the horse or maybe I trot the horse around on a, on, a, on a lunge line to see if it's lame or whatever. So can you talk to me about like what fascinated you and what, how you got into lunging as a discipline? <clears throat> Good morning, Betsy. Thank you so yeah. much for having me. Um, I, I, I did learn to lunge from my very first trainer from my, the very beginning. It was when I started my concentrated work with my maestre, who is Dominique Barbier, and his, his entire method begins with groundwork, work in hand, lunging, riding. What I've come to believe is that lunging, work in hand, lunging, and riding are really, in a sense, the same thing. That sounds like a really weird thing, because I my favorite is that people say, Liz, I don't want to lunge, I want to ride. You know, it's such a waste of time. But lunging is riding, and it's the beginning of your relationship and your conversation with your horse, both in terms of the relationship and in terms of that day. It's 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 the good more it's the cup of coffee in the morning with your honey. It's, there's so much involved with the connection of groundwork and, and riding. And I just cannot imagine going out to the barn and hopping on my horse. I think it seems rude. And I just, if I was a horse, I'd go, lady, hello, can we, can we talk first? Can we begin our conversation? Can, can we, you know, set our set our relationship for the day. And for me, that's a lot of what lunging is. So you mentioned, right, it's that kind of the cup of coffee in the morning. So to use an analogy, right? So let's say we live with a roommate or you're going to work and it's kind of that, that, that first few minutes of, hey, how was your day, right? It's that small talk that we have just to check in on, you know, with our horse, right? Is, is that how you characterize that? Um, I, you know, at the very beginning. <clears throat> I do. It's a little, it's, it's not... And it's funny because as I as you said that I realized it's not small talk, it's important talk. Okay, gotcha. But it it's the beginning of the conversation. It, it's a chance for the two of you to connect. It's a chance for the horse to wake up. Very, very many horses have been standing in a stall or in a barn in a very enclosed place, or they've been standing still out in a field in their horse world. It's an invitation, it's the time for you to connect your worlds together. Mm -hmm. to, to start off. So how, how is that different? Um, because I, I think you're talking about a certain quality in the way that you're interacting with a horse in the beginning of the lunging or lunging, sorry. And, you know, and, and the, the period that we're doing lunging, but I'm, I'm talking about at the very beginning here is um, because I've, I've seen people do this and, and there is, I think um, there's a, a line of thought that says, well, we're going to lunge the horse because I'm going to let it blow off steam and get its yayas out. Right. You know, I hear that a lot, but I think you're talking more that there's a little more nuance and a deeper quality to that conversation in the beginning versus, you know, clipping on, you know, a lunge line and hey, yeehaw, let's go around the circle, right? So can you talk a little bit more about kind of those first moments and, and where the quality might be different? Because I'm, I'm hearing that and what you're saying is, is a little more rich, right? <clears throat> sure, and, and you bring up a really good point. A lot of people use lunging um, as, a, as, a, 
as a protective measure. They do want the horse to be able to move freely, which is great. Um, I find that people who say, oh, I'm gonna lunge my horse so he can get the bucks out. For me, that's, that's diametrically opposed to where I wanna start my, my day. Horses who are running, bucking, leaping, are very rarely totally enjoy when they're on the end of a lunge line. Usually when a horse is on the end of a lunge line or when you are working with them and they're behaving that way, it's actually often just the opposite. They are tense, they are hurting, they are have way too much pent up energy, they've been overfed with grain and not allowed to move enough and not allowed to have to have relaxation time. And that very often when I find that people say, oh, I'm gonna get the bucks out, within three days, your horse has learned, oh, you know what? She wants me to buck. I'm gonna do it, because that's her expectation, that's the picture she has, that's what she intends, I'm gonna do it. Horses are so accommodating and so present that they will often do what you asked them to. And if you believe that your horse needs to buck and run and plunge and kick and guess what, they'll do it. And you can teach them to do so in very short order. I, yeah. That's not what I want for my horse. If my horse wants to play first thing, I'm going to by all means let him. But for a fairly limited time, and if he wants to play too much, or if he is really acting in a explosive manner, I'm going to ask myself, is something going on with him physically or emotionally? Or have I not been letting my horse have enough actual exercise and movement time? And that's, I, I, I certainly with a young horse, they'll play and they'll move, but you don't want out of control on the end of a lunge line. Turning your horse loose, that's something totally different. When you turn your horse loose and you don't chase him, you don't chase him, you don't, entice him to act that way he can do what he wants and that's great so you talk about play right versus being explosive and emotional right so and i, and I think you know if, if if we look at the horse you can kind of tell the boot right the playfulness and and i'm woo right versus i'm really not feeling good about this and now i'm at the end of the line and i'm letting you know i'm really yep. not happy yep. right so let's say um let's let's break this down or maybe it's the same as so i you know i have my horse on the on the lunge line and maybe he's a little playful maybe he's you know a little crabby right or distracted um is this something that you you know is there a technique that you use to um you know start to have that communication like hey you know let's let's start talking or, you know, can you walk me through that process? Because I think this is where a lot of people kind of get stuck where they say, well, again, to your point, I'm just going to let them reel out and go crazy, or um, I'm just going to let them play. And then the horse plays and plays and plays and basically we're reinforcing. And I know for a lot of people actually that can be really scary because it's big, right? It can be yeah. very explosive. Um, so, so how do we kind of bring that energy in or that, that relationship in with the horse on the lunge line that is saying, Hey, let's start talking to each other. Let's start engaging. Like how, how do you do that? I mean, you know, as much as you can, it's hard to do in, a, in a, an interview, but can you kind of talk through like maybe the mental process or, or the steps that you take? Sure. And, and you're right. That's a question people have. Some, some days it's a question I have. Um, you want to stay present in the moment and, and try and read how your horse feels. If your horse is feeling joyful and he's having fun, you know, you can let him play for a circle or two or three. If, if you notice, I, I have a dear friend who lunges a horse and at a certain point in his work every day, the horse explodes. And what I believe is happening at that point is the horse is saying, oh my God, I'm so uncomfortable. And, and so you have to read the energy. You can start off, and there's other horses, for instance, that you know they're not gonna start off being extra energetic, they're gonna start off being really slow and kind of sound asleep. And those are the same things. You haven't established a connection or an intention. And when you want to establish an intention for a conversation or a connection, 
you you feel it out if you're walking down the street with your friend and you guys are talking about something and somebody instantly changes the subject and you're just left behind you're like were you not listening to me it's the same thing with your horse on the lunge it's a conversation so you just need to within a fairly short period let the horse play a little bit there's nothing wrong with playing but within a minute maybe two you want to say thank you great this is wonderful i appreciate your energy but now let's let's settle down to work it's a little bit like a five-year-old in preschool the kids come in they're excited they're running around they're like yeah we're happy to see their friends but within a fairly short period the teacher is going to say okay let's get organized kids and let's begin our day same same thing with your horse and so you just have energy so is there a consistent cue, right? Because going back to that preschool analogy, right? The, you know, old school teacher claps their hands, hey kids, whatever, right? You know, there, but there's some cue that the kids know every single time. So is there a cue that you use with your horse or that you're, um, you know, especially if you're starting, you know, lunging, is, is there a consistent thing that I'm saying, okay, hey, let's settle down and, and I'd like to have a conversation with you or let's settle down and, and start really engaging with each other? <clears throat> so th I can't say there's a specific cue, what I will say is when I'm first lunging and I have a horse who's kind of playing, a lot of times I'll get distracted into their play. What I'll do is very quickly bring myself back into, I want this rhythm, I want this gait, I want this size of circle, and I start to create the picture of what I want. And it's amazing how quickly the horse will come into your picture. If he doesn't right away, maybe your picture needs to be clarified. You don't know how, what rhythm you want for your trot. You don't know if you want a walk or a trot or a canter. And he might offer something different. And at that point you say, thank you, I want the trot. And I want this trot and I want this rhythm and I want this size of circle. And you get into your picture and your presence. And it's really stunning how often the horse will, will quickly join you. So if he doesn't, yeah, if go he ahead. Join you, then you go back into a little bit of a work in hand mode and you bring the horse closer to you and you ask the horse to go around you in a smaller circle and 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 ask him to connect with you that way and then you can go back to the lunging. Work in hand and mixing work in hand and lunging is a powerful tool to bring the horse more with you. Yeah, interesting. And I think I think one of the things that you were talking about is the picture and your, you know, and, the, and having a plan, right? Which I think, again, from a lunging perspective for a lot of people, they don't have a plan, right? They, they're coming in there and saying, I'm going to get the yayas out or I'm going to get the bucks out. So it sounds like one, I've got to walk in there and say, okay, lunging is just like my ride time, right? So mm -hmm. I'm going to come in and I'm going to lunge. Um, and today we're going to, we're going to walk you know, I want to walk at this, you know, this speed, I want to do it at this diameter of the circle, and I want to do it for these many times around or X minutes or whatever, or today I'm going to work on a trot or whatever. But having that plan before I'm walking in and having the horse at the end of the launch line, right? And then, and then when you say like having them part of the plan, that's the visualization, right? In your head being very clear about what it is you're going to ask for and what it is you're looking for, correct? Or am I oversimplifying that? <clears throat> no, actually, you stated it beautifully. So in the horse world, um, there's basically one horse who's in charge pretty much all the time, and everybody else in the herd is going to follow that horse. When you are working with your horse, one of you has to be in charge, and one of you has to know what is happening in order to clue the other one in. And that person had really better be the person, the human. Very often people work with their horse and go, oh, this stupid horse, he does this and he does that and he's doing this and he's thinking this and he did this to me. And, and, and I would ask that person, what was your intention? I don't know, I want to trot. Well, that's not clear enough. Horses are so intelligent and so intuitive and so in the present moment you need to have a plan and you need to be in charge of the dance of the of of the partnership of the conversation doesn't mean you don't listen back you've got to listen back but somebody's got to be in charge and it really should be you and the big mistake people make is they go in with an empty head or one that's not clear enough about specifics and and then they wonder how come the horse is doing things
Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I can I can tell you from experiences because I, I I do um, a lot of lunging and and I was taught um, very similar, right? That we we do the lunging to check in and that's part of our relationship. Um, and when I a don't have a plan or b I'm distracted, right? So maybe I've had a long day and I'm not really there. Uh, that is the time when my horse will end up exploding or, you know, not, you know, not doing what, what I'm asking for, getting confused. And then that just sets the tone for the rest of the ride. Right. So I found it's really, um, important and I'll actually sometimes write down, okay, today in, in my lunging, we're going to work on the canter, right. Or, you know, I'm going to be very specific about what I want to do there. And I found that that difference, but there's also that focus, right. That clarity and having that picture. Um, and, and, you know, what you said about having it really, really clear, like exactly what you're imagining your horse to look like in that mm -hmm. particular gate and so forth. Right. Um, you know, and that's something I think you've talked about as well. Um, but it's something that I've also, um, heard and, uh, it, you know, can you talk a little bit about that, about really sharpening your focus and like, okay, I want the horse to stop. So I'm really going to imagine that and your in, in what your body does somatically when you're, when you're thinking that clearly. Sure. You know, we spend a lot of our days, a little bit less now, because we're at home a little more, but we spend a lot of our days thinking and going in different directions. We're, we're thinking about four or five things at once, usually none of them really good, because frankly, they've done studies and the human brain can only do one thing very, very well. It's a lie that we can multitask, but that's a whole nother subject. Yeah. When you're with your horse, it's, as I said, horses are always present. If you are not present with them, you can either get in trouble or you're doing your horse a disservice, or honestly, you're doing yourself a disservice. That connected time that you get with your horse every day is, for me anyway, that, that's what I'm there for. If I want to go think about something else and chit chat with my friends or you know, make a phone call or text somebody, then I should go and do that. My time with my horse is my time with my horse. And if you aren't present with them, they're not going to be present with you and they're going to go off on their own program. And, and again, some of that is somebody has to be in charge. And if they don't feel that somebody is, is in charge, and I don't mean in a cruel way, it's always benevolent, but if you're not in charge, they're going to go do something else. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I've actually seen that in practice. Right. And I think it's also true <laughs> in the saddle, right. Where, you know, I, I'll tell you, um, luckily knock on wood, I haven't fallen a lot lately <laughs> in the past 10 years, but every single time it's happened, um, I can directly go back to, I was distracted. Um, my mind mm -hmm. was off in a different place and boom, you know, next thing I know I'm on the ground and I've heard others, friends of mine talk about that as well. Um, one question that I did have or, or an area I'd like to explore is, um, you know, when we're talking about, okay, we're going to have a plan, but then I, you know, you talked about really checking in in that relationship with the horse. So, um, over time as we're launching every day, I mean, what, what are the benefits that you see, um, relationship wise, but I also want to talk about some of the physical aspects as well, right? Because I think there's a contingent of people out there that really, um, can view lodging as very damaging to the horse, right? Um, and I'd kind of like to talk a little bit about that because I've heard that, oh, you know, don't do it in this 10 meter circle, you're going to hurt them. I've heard other people say, well, you know, it's balanced. No, it should always be on the 20 meter, blah, blah, blah. There's other people who walk them all around the arena. So I'm curious your thoughts on kind of that, those different um, ways of lunging and, and how that helps the horse physically, but also mentally. That, that's, a, that's a really good question, and it brings me to kind of largely to the point of why I lunge. So if we're going to have the audacity to sit upon a horse and, and ride them, in my mind, it behooves us, and it is our then given responsibility to teach them how to carry us comfortably, how to carry themselves comfortably, and how to best maintain their bodies in balance. And what that means is that the horse needs to learn to be round and roundness is for the back of the horse. Roundness is for the connection of the horse's back end to the front end. 
A horse has a spine that goes all the way from the base of his tail all the way up to the pole between the ears. It's all one spine. And if that spine is compromised and the horse is not round, and literally I think of it in terms of a gentle curve ball, then they can hurt themselves. The next thing is that the horse needs to be able, they, can, they have kind of two choices. They can pull themselves through space, hurl themselves through space is more than two, I guess, or they can send themselves through space. And when a horse sends himself through space, which is that the back end is, is the engine, is, is the driving force, and that's the last time I'll use that word today, um, then, then they can begin to carry their whole bodies in a balanced manner. And then when you go and sit on them and sit upon their backs, their backs are up in a position that is most safe for them to carry you. Their back is are not sunk, their head is not raised, their neck is not crinked in a completely unnatural way. And the horse beginning to find how he can move himself is what we owe to him before we go sit on him. And that is round and forward and, and relaxed. And so that's like, again, to, 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 I think, have an analogy for some listeners, right? Am I, you know, you, if you're going to go and you like, let's say fitness, for example, right? You know, I'm not going to go and grab a 300 pound barbell and start doing squats, right? I'm going to, I'm going to start maybe could, doing you air, do you, you could, but I would be really angry and pissed off about that. Right, it might hurt myself. I might do things like this, right? Um, and coming from a fitness background, right? You know, this is a very bad thing to do. Uh, but um, you know, it's the same thing, right? I might start with with air squats. I might start with a bar, right? But I'm 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 getting my body and my muscles right in mm -hmm. in, in shape, and I'm and I'm and I'm slowly getting that place where I'm building myself up to have that strength and that 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 flexibility. And I think all the kind of the, the motor skills to be able to handle a rider, right? Um, yeah. Without the encumbrance of the rider, like not having to learn those two things at the same time right. for, for that. So, um, and I think that goes back to that visualization, right? So it's not like we're, we're going to let the horse go around and around crazy beans. We're going to say, oh, we want this nice round, you know, moving from the back end, sending themselves forward, you know, and, and not going crazy in different gates and things like that, but really having that clarity to help with that, then they kind of catch up physiologically, correct? Is that, is yeah. that how I'm understanding that? Okay. Yeah, that's, yeah. yeah. So, so uh, question then I think for some of the listeners who, um, let's talk about, I think, uh, demystifying some things or maybe clarifying because I know there's a lot of beliefs around launching. So let's talk about the, um, oh my God, this is bad for your horse, right? You know, because they're in and they're going in a circle like this or they're going to go lame, right? We, I think we've all heard some of those. Um, so, so you're saying it's actually beneficial to build up the horse. Um, clearly there's other sentiment around it because I think people have seen um, lunging do bad things to the horse. So, so can you talk about your feelings about that, the differences, you know, why lunging might be bad for a horse done improperly um, and where some of these, these belief systems might have started to come in? Sure. The, um, there, there is a kind of lunging that's bad for the horse. When you put the horse on the end of a lunge line and incite him to run around and he puts his nose to the outside, which is the natural quote unquote that most horses in the very beginning will balance themselves by bending to the outside and they put their weight onto their front end and they basically hurl around the circle that is not lunging it in in my mind mm -hmm. when when a horse is upside down in his spine and his head is up and his back is hollow you are very likely to incur injury. There is no doubt about it, especially if you do it on too small a circle. So what we wanna teach the horse, one of the reasons we're doing the lunging is to teach the horse to carry himself in a balanced way, which means that he needs to bend to the inside so that he has the ability to put his inside leg underneath him and can propel himself through the circle or through a space or through any line whatsoever in a balanced way. And bend is important. 
um, bent, bent on the circle is, is important when you're lunging. That's why sometimes the round pen, especially if they're loose, can be negative because they go around bent to the outside. A horse bent to the outside is you're not helping him. You're not teaching him anything. You need to show him that when he is bent to the inside that he's gonna be more comfortable and particularly more balanced. And the size of the circle, can, it can be too small. It, it, but again, it's the shape of the horse in relation to the circle that's the most important. Interesting. And I think also, too, one of the things that I've seen, and, and this is kind of in more extreme cases, but there's an issue of centrifugal force, right? So it's, it's not only that the horse is bent to the outside with a head up, right? But then they're on the end of this, um, this line going at speed, and the butt yeah. is like blinging out, right? So where we think that the leg is actually coming underneath, really, the horse is not bent in an arc, they're just kind of you know, at the end of this line flailing about, right? And that's, right. I think, you know, so you've got the combination, the head up, the back arch, and now we've got the leg moving under weirdly with centrifugal force. Um, you know, I'm thinking especially horses that are going around, say, at a gallop, yeah. right? People like to do that. Um, so, so it sounds like, you know, starting at the walk gate might be, especially if you're inexperienced to doing this or maybe want to restart in a different way, that starting at the walk might be better, right? You know, you see a lot of people are really attached to the trot. Do you have any opinion about gates or where to start and, and how to do that on the lunge line? <clears throat> the lunge line. <laughs> Sorry. Right. Yeah. No, no problem. Lunging and lunging, they're the, they're the same thing. As, not as, as long as you're not lounging around, it's okay. <laughs> um, so the, it's interesting because very few horses in the very beginning really want to walk on a lunge line. I, it's, I feel personally that walking on the lunge is really important, but I rarely will start there because it's very difficult for a horse walking is its own gait with its own um, difficulties because there isn't often enough energy to keep the forward movement in the beginning. When you have a trained horse, it's a whole nother story. But in the beginning, trotting is generally what I will start with on the lunge. Um, it doesn't mean that the horse is allowed to trot quickly or rushing or racing around or being upside down again, as I said. Um, but generally, I'll, I'll let the horse trot. There are horses who really, who will start off and who will prefer and find it easier to actually canter on the lunge. And I'll even allow that if, if it's a calm canter. What I want is calm and forward. And those two things, that's a dance. There's a dance between calm and forward, particularly in the beginning. And sometimes you have to cross a line for a moment or two in one direction or the other. I had a friend I was helping lunge years ago and she, her horse really, really went big, big forward on the lunge. And she said, I just, I can't lunge him. He, he just goes too big, big forward. And I said, that's okay. You can allow that. And she said, no, no, he's, he'll do that when I get on number one. And, and number two, he's, he's going to hurt himself. And I said, you know, if you have your horse that's too, too big on the circle and your side reins are properly adjusted, which is a subject we'll talk about in a minute, the circle is never ending and they figure out very quickly that that circle is not going to end and they will slow down. They will start to breathe. Now, one thing that I can mention here and we should mention over and over and over again is breathing is really important. When your horse is flying around, you have to stay calm. You have to breathe. You have to keep your feet on the sand on the ground. And sometimes you can bring the circle in let it out again. Sometimes now is the time, actually, if you feel like you have lost the horse's mind, then you bring the horse in, you do some work in hand, you send them back out, and, and they go. Very, 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 very often when a horse is running around on the lunge line, it's because somebody taught them to do so. They learned quickly that that was the expectation. It's like the bucking, you know? It's like people say, oh, I, I want my horse to move really big and you know, get out his extra energy, so I'm going to teach him to go fast. Well, you need to teach him and tell him and explain to him that, thank you, but I, I want this instead. And so you, you do what you can. You can make the circle smaller. You can have walk transitions. You can have halt transitions. You can stop. 
go to the horse and walk with him in a circle with you at his head, being calm and breathing, and, and you take your time. And very quickly, if you have a clean and clear expectation, they'll figure it out. You know, the breathing, it's so funny because this is coming up in practically every interview I've done so far. And, and I, think it's, I think it's so, so important, right? Because um, I, I, I know at different um, times in my horse riding career that, uh, you know, lunging was really frightening for me, right? Um, uh, yeah. there, there are times um, that I have had where I have had a horse at the end of the line that was extremely explosive, right? You know, and I, I'm literally like, okay, breathe, 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 right? Because it's, it's, it's big, right? Um, and uh, so, you know, I think that's something too that we, you've talked about the focus and having a clear picture, but I think also having this awareness of, are you holding your breath? Are you holding yourself tense? Like, where are you, you know, or doing this, right? You know, I've even caught myself holding the, like not pulling on it, but then I'm gripping, right? Because I'm, I'm not breathing and I'm having anxiety. So um, what do you do? Because I, I know you work with a lot of horses, but when you do have that, that, that situation, like your friend had, oh, he's too big, I'm, I'm nervous about this, or I've got a horse, you know, very energetic or really playful in a way that makes me anxious. What do you do? Do you just say, okay, I'm going to breathe now? Or, you know, how, how do you, how do you work through that anxiety, especially for somebody who maybe is new to this? Um, so a couple things, number one, make sure that the space that you're working in is small enough that um, you, you feel that you can control the situation to lessen your anxiety. Number one, number two, if your horse is too big energy, know that he's trying to deal with his energy. And so now it's up to you to help him solve his problem. He either is too much energy because he's a little frightened, which is very common. People don't often teach horses to lunge correctly in the beginning and they get scared. It's a scary experience for them, or they have too much energy, or they have a little bit of physical issues, you know, working on that circle. So again, as I said, you can bring the horse in, do your work in hand with you at his head, calm, breathing, even stopping for a minute, even stopping for two minutes and just breathing together. You can go to the horse and walk with him on the circle, just, just walking, just, just walking and, and, have, and calming yourself and then you can ask him to go back out on the circle. Um, sometimes it helps to ask the horse to walk, but generally when a horse has big energy like that, asking them to walk is gonna make it worse because now they don't know what to do with themselves. And then you can play with the size of circle. You can bring the circle in, you can let the circle out. One of the most important things you can do for yourself, and I had a big lesson in this myself this winter, is you can, Take a big breath out, or five or six, out and smile. Doesn't that sound crazy? But it's true. <laughs> you, you can, horses see us. They read our faces. They've done studies now that, that horses can, can really truly read human expression on our faces. And if we're going, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, they're going to go there with you. And, and if they're already there, and they're being too big and too much energy, it's your job to help them to calm down. And so how do they calm down? They can slow down, they can stop, they can start over. Sometimes you want to let them go for a circle or two being, being bigger. Again, make sure your space is is a good size. I don't recommend starting a lunging a horse who's either difficult or who's a young horse in a gigantic arena. It's not a good idea. Give yourself a little space. And, and even from the very beginning with a little baby, I'll, I'll have a little baby and I'll work them in hand in their pen. That's, that's where you begin to establish how, how things go. And but doesn't, doesn't yeah, so doesn't that seem counterintuitive, right? Because I'm sure, again, um, I've got a horse that's big, right? And you're saying young or, or, you know, inexperienced or maybe a little more energetic, and I want to give myself a smaller space. And I think that people would sit there and say, well, no, I'd want the bigger space to let them, them go out. And then I think there's another part of, 
um, some anxiety of, oh, now I'm in the smaller enclosed space, right? You know, even to you were saying there, you know, where the foal is in the pen. So can you talk a little bit about that, um, why that's important and that the big space, why it sounds like a good idea may not be the best idea? Well, and it's relative, okay? I'm not talking about, I'm not saying that you should bring your horse in on a five or six or seven or even 10 meter circle to, to control the horse, but that big open expanse, one of the things that happens to people subconsciously when the horse is on the end of a lunge line and they start to, to misbehave is everyone has a moment where they think, oh crap, my horse is gonna get away, okay? So if you can take that fear away, and, and again, you know, it, it's, a, it's a dancing space, it, it's a communication, it's, it's walking down the road holding your honey's hand in the evening on a walk. That's, that's the feeling that you want to have. And as I said, so often it's us who, who are anticipating or expecting when your horse has done something two or three times, that's the picture we put in our head. We now need to be okay my horse gets a little too big and I need to have a totally different picture for him. And they, unless a horse is in pain. Now, if a horse is in pain and, and they have a true and real physical issue, or if they have really ingrained fear, those are a little bit more difficult. And it, in that case, um, you know, you can, you can get help. You can, you can call me and, and I'll help you through it. Um, and so, those are slightly more extreme things. But what really, Betsy, is so interesting to me is that if you have your picture and if you have your side reins properly and correctly adjusted, if you have not put your horse over bent, never, ever put your horse over bent. Those are the horses who will try and take off because they're in pain and they're scared and I don't blame them. Then, then it, you know, if you just begin two or three times bringing the circle in, walking, going back out, they figure it out. They're not dummies. They don't want to feel out of control. So you put that feeling yourself into, okay, yes, you have a problem, no problem. I'm going to show you again what I want. I want this trot, one, two, one. And you count. You can count out loud. I, I actually... At one time, I had a little metronome, and it was really cool. The metronome was really cool. You can, you can sing a song. You can, you know, picture an old horse that you know who does know how to lunge and pretend you're lunging that horse. Also, what's really important is people who, when they get frightened, when the horse gets frightened, he will try to pull away. Do not allow contact with the lunge line between your hand and his mouth. Don't let him touch it. So when you mean contact, um, I, so I wanna talk on two things, right? Cause you've mentioned the side reins a couple of times and, and I will say that side reins is a very polarizing topic um, <laughs> and we could get into that. Uh, but um, you talked about the contact, right? So um, that, that I would take to mean, right? So the horse is beginning to be explosive and spin out and the line gets very taut, right? And so now I'm literally pulling on the bit, right? Because I'm, I'm you know, the way that it was explained to me by a maester that I worked with uh, was that um, you, the horse is gonna start to want to have something to fight with and to lean on, right? And then we create that very hard contact and you can't, you're never gonna win that argument. So one of the things that I was taught when I was lunging is as they were beginning to, is that I would take a couple of steps forward, right? And, and, and follow them, we're still on the circle, but I wasn't allowing them to drag me or pull me. I wasn't getting into that pulling match. Is that kind of what you're, what you're alluding to or is there something else? So partly that, yes, and, and, but, but more than that, um, horses don't want contact. Mm -hmm. They don't want people touching their mouths. Imagine, Betsy, we're walking around with a piece of steel on our gums. I don't want anybody to touch it, and neither do they. They're very, very, very sensitive animals, and we've put a metal bit in their mouth, and they don't want contact. They want connection totally different idea. So when I'm lunging a horse, I want to have a little bit of a loop 
in that rain. I don't want to even feel his mouth except for momentary. If I need to touch his mouth for a moment, I might touch his mouth for a moment. The rest of the time on that, with that lunge line, there's a softness in it. And there's basically the weight of the lunge line between you and him. When you pull on a horse, that's how they make racehorses run. They take two-year-old babies and they get up on them and they get as far forward over their poor little shoulders as they possibly can. And they take as tight a connection on that rein as they possibly can. And they teach the horse to run because they have to catch up with themselves. That's not, we don't, we don't want that. We want the balance. Horses are not dumb. They will find balance if we allow them to do so. And um, unless a horse has something really wrong in his brain, which I've met two horses out of hundreds in my lifetime, that there was something funny in their brain. One of them was probably funny in his neck in hindsight. Or, or they have a physical difficulty. They have a physical something that they come up against and, and it hurts and, and it zings and they run. Horses run when they're frightened. So if you can keep your picture, what your, what your person who helped you to do was a very good idea. And often if I'm having a difficulty with a horse, I'll put the horse in the corner of the arena. So I have now at least two sides. And if he's pulling on me, um, I have one technique where I put my hand behind the small of my back, which I love that because horses will not pull anymore if your hand is fixed, both on the lunge line and in the saddle, by the way. Um, but then I can move into the, into the corner when the horse is by the fence, I can step towards him. That may be the first time in your horse's life that he's ever felt, oh, she's not going to pull on the lunge line. And, and as soon as they figure out you're not going to pull on them, they're not going to pull on you. They don't want to pull. They don't. They don't want to fight. They're scared and they're coping. Horses cope every minute of every day with whoever is working with them. They cope the best they know how. And the coping can get negative because they have too much to cope with and their person's not helping them. Or the coping can be positive because they're in a partnership. Gotcha. Yeah. And that, and that makes sense. And I, and I was also taught the same, the, to use the corner, right. Yeah. Um, and, and that, that makes things, you know, a little more, I don't want to say snug. It's almost a little bit like a security blanket, right. But you're, you know, you've got, you've got a little more area of um, in control is the bad word to use, but I think you know what I'm talking about. Right. So I want to get to side reins because we've, it's been mentioned a few times. Um, I know that side reins is a very polarizing topic for people. Um, they're, uh, side reins can be used in very good ways. They can be used in very bad ways. So um, let's talk about you. You've mentioned it. You're, you, you know, you, you see that there's a positive. So talk to me about side reins. Um, you've obviously been doing this for, for decades. Talk to me the, the pros and the cons of side reins and, and how you've come to, there's a way that you can use it that's helpful for the horse and the way that you use the side reins. So um, the way that I use the side rein, and, and I was taught this, uh, Dominique and Deborah Barbier both um, have, have advocated this for many, many years. There's this silly, silly idea that humans came up with that the side rein should be high up on the horse because when we ride them, our hands are high. Well, this is, this is, so typical of somebody thinking like a human and not thinking like a horse. The side rein should be adjusted down low on the girth so that when it crosses the shoulder, it's parallel to the ground. You want the horse's, the corner of his mouth and the end of the side rein attached to the bit to be in a parallel line across the shoulder, parallel to the ground, which means that people who use lunging surcingles, for instance, everyone says, oh no, you put the, you put the side rein up on the, on the metal loop and that, that's up high, so it must be where it goes. Well, I'm here to tell you, I've never seen a surcingle train a horse. The surcingle has, where those loops are, has nothing to do with what the horse needs. And so this lower side rein allows the horse to be that round shape that we alluded to a little while ago and allows him to put his head and neck in a position that his back is able to work. Again, we're talking about one spine. And now if, you're, if your side rein is low, 
and then invites the horse to be bent to the inside, then you're covered. Now there's two ways of using the side reins. Deborah Barbier came up with this brilliant method um, some time back. She was working with horses who'd been really compressed and really jammed and they, they had difficulties in their backs and they had difficulties in their mind. And so she began to use one side rein. Who thought of that? Everybody though, you look in all the books, it's always two side reins. But what she found was that when you use the one side rein, the horse is not so afraid and doesn't make mistakes. If you're going to use two side reins, you really, really, really need to make certain that the outside side rein has been adjusted very long to allow the horse to bend. This idea that we want even contact and the two sides should be even is is so detrimental to horses. It's a brand new idea in the last 30, 40 years. It's absolute nonsense. It has nothing to do with classical training. The horse needs to be bent and needs to be allowed to bend and be comfortable. And so, so that side brain adjustment needs to allow that. On, on the outside, right? So that I can actually bend. And, and the interesting thing that you're talking about side rein is in terms of bend, right? That allowing the horse to bend or to encourage that position and I'm not hearing you say which I hear a lot about side reins is to encourage the horse in the contact right and you know to encourage them to get the contact or be on quote on the bit right so so and you said that this um this has been a kind of something new from the last 30 40 years so can you can you comment on that a little bit more because I think that's a prevailing wisdom is we use side reins to one put position not bend but two, it's this uh, promoting contact, right? Is right. something I hear a lot, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I, 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 I don't want contact. Mm -hmm. I want connection. They're totally different things. The word contact came, oh gosh, about 30, 40 years ago, there was a couple of authors who began to talk about contact. I think it's been tremendously misunderstood. I, w I want a connection, yes, but to me, the idea that a horse wants for his person to have some weight in the rein that's attached to the bit that's attached to his gums is the stupidest idea I've ever heard in my life. If I was a horse, I would want someone to treat my mouth and that bit and the rein as if it was a silken thread. And now we have people talking about lifting weights so they can carry the contact of their highly schooled dressage horse. What, what a utterly stupid idea. And so this, what the side rein is doing is showing the horse a position. It's the position that we're trying to teach the horse so that he can carry us who again have the audacity to go and sit on him if we want to just let our horse run wild in the pasture and there's nothing wrong with that, but, and we're not going to ride him and we're not going to talk with him about what's in his best interests for his own body, we can let him go completely nuts. The, what we want to do is teach our horse how to bend and be round so that he can be comfortable and strong and use his back in a, in a strong and relaxed way and so the side rein does you do invite bend for sure but you're also inviting the nose to go down never ever behind the bit right so but we're encouraging the horse's nose to go down to bend right we're not encouraging the horse's nose to go down to be like like the chest piece right because I think that's yeah. that's a fundamental difference, right? Where where uh, you know people will use side reins, and we can talk about other systems, right? But I think side reins are the big, you know, where people are putting horses in a frame. You hear that, right? That I'm like, kind of almost in traction, right? I'm going to make you like this, right? Where you're saying, hey, I'm encouraging this, and and I think then the other thing is too that I'd like to also talk about is you know introducing the horse to that single side rein and in that concept of hey here's this position i'm encouraging you right where we've taken say a horse that is like this all the time maybe never had a side rein where we start with that but can you talk a little bit about the encourage of the bend and the encourage of the nose versus horking on a position right and really creating that that frame 
Sure. I, I do want to make sure that it's clear. When you invite a horse into the position, the position is on the bit, which is the nose on the vertical, never behind it. Young horses can fall behind the vertical for a moment, but you never leave them there and you never ever insist that the horse carry his nose behind the vertical, which many of the systems, lunging systems we see being used now do. And, and even, even with how you set a side rein, if you set a side rein high up on the saddle or even higher up on the girth and you make it too short, you're forcing the horse into a position. We don't force horses into position. We show them the position that they can comfortably carry themselves. Very different idea. So in the beginning, when you start with your young horse, you start with a really long side ring. Again, remember we talked about why do horses go flying around on the lunge line? Because so often they've been scared to death the first several times they were lunged because they, they felt that, that side rein for the first time and it was too tight and they couldn't get away from it and they felt trapped and in traction and compressed and, and they got scared. And I don't blame them, I'd be scared too. So you wanna start long and very gradually but, but progressively you wanna shorten it up until you have the horse in the correct position. Now that's the real discussion. What is the correct position? For a young horse, you want the neck to remain long. You don't want the horse to start to contract his neck or to contract the muscles just behind the withers or the spine. You want the horse to be able to freely move his back legs up. So the way that people ask me all the time, how short should my side rein be? I cannot answer that for you. And every day it may change. Here's what I can always say is the truth. Your side rein should be short enough that when the horse is in the wrong position, i.e. upside down, that he will touch it or it will touch him. Side reins don't make mistakes, they don't pull. Horses know this instinctively. So it needs to be short enough that if he goes up into the wrong position, the side rein will touch him. And then, even maybe more important, the side rein should be long enough that when he goes into the right position, that the, that side rein disappears for the horse in the horse's mind. It's, it's no longer contracts or contacts his mouth. It's just there. It's just, it's information. The side rein and the reins too for that matter, but the side rein should be information for the horse and a reminder about where he can be. Then it's a process. You need to give your horse time to be able to develop a long stride, to be able to develop the back muscles. We all talk about back muscles. Muscle cannot be developed when it's in contraction. This is physiology. Only relaxed muscle can develop. And so if you are creating tension, you're not creating muscle, you're creating contraction. And then that's when you get a lame horse, pretty much categorically. So it's, you know, if you want to picture the ideal horse, his nose and his mouth are at about the level of the point of his shoulder and his back legs are reaching up underneath the midline of his belly evenly on both sides. Very few horses start there. Very few. This, this is a little bit, it's a process. The horse needs to learn to be able to step underneath himself. He needs to learn to be able to have two legs stepping evenly. I don't know how many people I could ask today who are right-handed to please write me a beautiful letter in penmanship that I can read with their left hand today. It doesn't work that way. We're all one-sided. We need our horse, we need to give our horse time to develop the two sides and to learn to stretch the two sides. And that's on the horse's time, right? Because everybody's a little bit different. And I think that evolves over time. To your point, you're adjusting, you know, you're adjusting where that horse is that day, right? Because some days they might, they might need a little bit more. Some days they might be fine where we had it and so forth. So, so one question I do have with you is, so there are people who are, um, Using uh, different, uh, say the launch cabasson, right? So we we have the the rings on the on the um, the nose piece, right? We're not using sometimes the use side rings. We can get into that later, but you know you you generally see kind of two different, I would say, popular kind of rigs, right? Which is is the side rein, and then there's the one using just the cabasson with the with the 
with the um, lunge line clipped to the middle ring, right? And that seems to be uh, popular. Then there's also the, the rope halter with the Theodore knot at the bottom, right? And we have that on the bottom there. So, so can you talk to me a little bit about those, you know, the cabison or the rope halter, um, you know, feelings about that? Is there appropriate time and place for that? Or, you know, what, what is the thinking, you know, in your point of view over all these decades, what that's all about? So the cabison um, was invented um, to be a gentler way and to not frighten horses with the bit in their mouth. And, and I certainly understand that, that thinking. I, I owned a London cabison for years. I probably used it four or five times and, and I let it go away. My feeling is if it's time to start working with your horse and, and you have um, the skill to, to be certain that you're not going to pull on that bit or cause pain with that bit. I personally, I prefer to use the bit. If, if you are uncertain about your ability to do that, you can always start with the cavison. The cavison, as I said, was invented in a way to not frighten a young horse and not insist that they put, you know, the bit there. It's pretty hard to get a horse in a good position with the cavison. What is a good position again? The position is around with the neck long and the nose low and bent to the inside. That cavison doesn't really help you too much. If you try to use a side rein to that cavison, you're going to be putting so much pressure on it. It's going to be so short in order to invite that real position. I don't think it's productive. Um, you know, you can start it in the beginning. It's... I. You can use it if you want, but it doesn't get you very far down the road. If you do start with a lunging cavison, I would fairly quickly, um, you know, within a month or so, that's a wild guess, um, transition to, to using the bit. If your horse is old enough and mature enough and is time to start his training process, there's nothing harmful about a bit. The bit doesn't hurt the horse. The human using the bit hurts the horse. It's, yeah. Very important to remember that. And, and I don't encourage, I do not, I, I see people now use lunge lines put up over the top of the pole and attached to the two sides of the bit. That makes no sense to me at all. I don't think I would like it at all if I was a horse. And the reason for that is now, no matter what you do, if you touch that lunge line, and even when you're not touching the lunge line, you have now created pressure on both sides of the bit. The horse can't get away from it, number one. And even for the older horse, what is, what is the bit, what is closing your fingers on the bit mean? It means one of two things. It means put your nose down so I can give, or it means stop. So now you have a lunge line tied through the bit, up and over the pole to the other side, and saying stop, 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 and you're saying go, go, go. And the horse is like, what, what, I don't know. I don't know what my mom wants. Plus, there's, a, there's that pressure on the pole now, too. There's a lot is, of, yes. it's, it's introducing another area of traction, right? So, exactly. plus the bit. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, I totally hear you on the, uh, the side reins on the calves. And so, I'm curious, um, uh, you know, you see this more in the Western disciplines or, you know, natural, uh, which is the rope halter with the wine at the bottom. Right, we're, we're lunging um, on a circle with loose, right? You usually see it's pretty pretty loopy um mm -hmm. and what again you know so it sounds like there's the same kind of consideration there that the horse there's really no i mean it's very gentle especially if your horse that is is not acquainted or you're not um clear on your hand right but it's it sounds like there's the same issues of not inviting to the bend and things like that correct i mean is that is that how you'd view that that setup <clears throat> yeah i as quickly as I can, so many of these devices and all the stuff that we do, if, when you're using tools, if you use the tool with the intention that you are introducing something to the horse for the first time and you're increasing his understanding, and then you're teaching him that when you show him something or ask him something that he is going to say, okay, I will do this for you because it's comfortable and for me and easy for me. Any device, whether it's a rope halter that puts can put a good bit of pressure across that nose don't you be confused about that anything that you're using when you are using the device to force the horse into anything no matter what device it is to me that's the wrong path 
I do not want to force my horse. I want to educate my horse. And that may take some time. That'll take some explanation, but it goes actually so much more quickly than people believe or, or think is even possible when you know what your picture is and what you're after and what you're asking your horse to do and why you show them within a few days, they're there. The problem comes in when people have confusion and people aren't sure, or people try to force the horse into what they believe is correct for the horse and he's not ready, or it's the wrong position for him. Uh, you know, you can put a horse in the wrong position. You can force a horse in hand. You can force a horse on the lunge line. You can force a horse from the saddle. To me, it's not, it's not the right direction. And so any physical device, I don't care what it is, if, if the device is, is creating what's happening, you're on the wrong path. You, you need to show your horse what to do. Yeah, and I would, I would say like a good analogy is probably yoga, right? Because there's, there's positions in yoga that people can do. And um, we have an ideal of some of those. And you're, you're smiling because I'm sure you've done yoga too. And, and I'm not really that great at it. <laughs> and um, okay. <laughs> I, I, I can't get to those ideals. And I had a situation one time where I was taking yoga class and we were doing some sort of a pose and I, I can't remember the name of it. And um, I just could not get my, my rear end to my heels. I mean, that's just, I wasn't yeah. that flexible. And the yoga yeah. instructor walked over and sat on my tailbone yeah. and I was in excruciating pain. And she's like, you need to be here. I couldn't get there. Right. And I mean, maybe I could get there with two years of practice um, because at the time, right. you know, I was doing figure and bodybuilding very seriously. And I just, was not, yeah. you know, I was taking yoga to be flexible, right. Not to, yeah. to be a yogini. And so she was putting me in a position that my body just couldn't do. And I think there's a really good analogy here for the horse, which is we're encouraging things that help make them feel better. Right. But they're all going to move at their different speed. Um, yes. And we don't want to force and we don't want to push and we don't want traction. And your horse might take a year. My horse yep. might take three months. Somebody yep. else's horse might take five. And, yep. but there's no one right answer, right? There's an ideal yep. that we'd right. like to encourage, but we're never, you know, just as there's riding humans, right? We're not all yoginis. Yeah the same thing was yeah. with a horse, right? Um, and so I, I think that's a really good thing to remember because a lot of us, um, I think we see pictures and we see videos and we see this very snapshot in time, this very idealized state and the horse is not holding that for an hour, right? right. right. You know, right. Yeah. right, like you see a stallion in the field and they're, you know, and they're really that, that amazing look. Right. Um, but you can't make your, your stallion or your gelding or your mare hold that position for an hour. And especially when they are not physically fit to do it. Right. Right. Yeah, no, that's very true. It's a great analogy. I do, I, I, I do think about yoga. Dressage is supposed to be, it's even sometimes described that way. It's yoga for horses. Yes, it should be in your best interest. And, and I'm sorry that your instructor did that, but Betsy, now you have a clue what, many horses are going to feel like when they are forced into a position that they simply cannot do. I highly encourage, I really think it would be in every horse person's best interest for their horse to go and pick a sport that is difficult for them and practice it for two years. You know, we're, we're asking our horses to, to be all these things that we think that they are. And many of them, it's, it's easy, but we mess it up. And if you have, a, you know, a yoga instructor who goes and sits on your tailbone, ouch, that just, that's just not fair. It's, it's a partnership. Now, the, the tricky thing, and it is not, it's not easy. It takes years to, to be able to, to judge because while you don't want to force a horse, you also don't want a horse to spend a whole lot of time being in the wrong position because he's not ready. And, and that's the conundrum. That's when you have to really decide, um, you know, what, how, how much you're going to push it. it. It's like, you know, don't make does, we do a lot of shoulder in work. And he often says that the four track shoulder in is like touching your toes when all you can do is touch your knees. So if you have a horse who can only touch his knees today and you force him to touch his nose, his toes, it's, it's going to be difficult for him. On the other hand, if you never ask him to go below the knee, 
inch by inch, then you don't get anywhere either. And, and that's what takes time. It, it's, it, I encourage people to look, watch their horse, pay attention to their horse, see what the look is in their eyes, see what the look is in their ears, and go slowly and steadily. But do progress, but you don't, you don't want to force anything. And it takes horses time to get to be supple. You yeah. know, supple it's something that, that, the, that we become. It is not something that we do. You don't supple a horse. I, it's not a verb. It's, it's an adjective. And if you think of it in terms of an, being an adjective that is steadily progressive, then you're going to be less likely to make some giant mistakes. Yeah, well, I, and again, going back to the analogy, right? We don't flexible a person. Right. You know, I mean, you don't, you don't go in there and make it right. You, you know, it takes us time. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. And I, I, I think the thing with a difficult sport is such a great suggestion, right? Because, you know, or I would just say, Hey, listen, if you don't do yoga, go take, go take a month worth of yoga classes and then you'll know yeah. what I'm talking about because yeah. right. You, you, you're in class and you see people and you're like, they're at all different levels and, and you know, your yoga instructor is doing amazing things and it's very frustrating and you are very surprised at the limitations of your body. And I think also I've had emotions about it, right. You know, I'll try and I get frustrated, whatever. And, and I think it's so analogous to working with horses. Right. And for me, I have a lot more empathy and I'm very cognizant of that when I'm working, working with my, you know, with my horse. So, um, so one last thing that I did want to talk about, um, because this has been extremely helpful. So I, you know, there are people watching this who maybe have never, um, you know, lunged or they're thinking about starting it or they had a bad experience. So would you like, what would be like your top three things if, if somebody were to watch this, this interview today, and then they would say, okay, well, now I want to go do this. Like, right. What, what, what kind of, you know, quick tips would you give somebody to start on that journey? I mean, other than calling you and, and having a lesson, but like, if they were to just leave this video, do you have any quick tips that somebody could do at home um, right away that would help? Sure. Get a cotton lunge line. Don't, don't do leather. Leave the chains away. Chains are a whole nother subject and I don't believe that chains belong on horses. I don't believe anything with a pulley. It belongs on a horse. Pulley devices, if you're using a pulley device on your horse, you're on the wrong path. That's categorical in my opinion. Um, get yourself a cotton lunge line and find yourself a relatively smaller space and simply begin by asking the horse to move around you in the circle. And, and from there, you progressively get, let the lunge line get a little bit longer. And if your horse is calm and forward and bent to the inside, you will not be doing any harm and maybe doing a significant amount of good. That's, that's the beginning. You know, I've been lunging horses for more than 40 years and I still learn things. It's, there's, I, we could talk for another three hours about it and hopefully we will. Because yes. there's a lot of specific skill things that sometimes are even easier to, to be shown than it is to, to describe. But those, those are the basics. Start with a, with a cotton lunge line in a relatively small space. Begin with just having the horse move around you in a circle have a very clear idea about what you want. Be ready to change your idea if you need something different to help your horse, but just begin there. And then from there, you want a rhythmic, consistent, calm, circular gait. And don't go on and on and on and on forever. Yeah. The people always ask me, how long should I lunge? You should lunge until you see the horse you want to ride. Or the other criteria that I use, honestly, that I like even better for myself is I lunge my horse until he is in a place where if I said, thank you very much, have a wonderful day, and I put my horse away, does he feel better than when I got him out, or does he not? I'm going to lunge my horse until he feels better. What does that look like? That looks like a calm, breathing happily, relaxed horse who's 
maybe chewing on his bit a little bit and, and who was happy, who's going to be happy to see you tomorrow. Yeah. And that sounds so simplistic, but it's huge. It's huge to leave your horse in a place where he felt good and was glad to have spent the time with you. If you put your, if you work with your horse and you put him away and you drive away, you should ask yourself every day, does my horse feel better than before I came? And if you can't honestly say, yes, he really, he feels better, then you need to change your path. Yeah. And one thing I will also say too, um, because I, um, I also do um, lunging work every ride uh and and i love the benefits of it um and it's funny you and i've come to a different path but we do the same thing um Mm -hmm. you know when i'm working with my mare dory one of the things you know you see that they're they're happy and they're breathing and they're relaxed but she also is um attentive like oh what are we going to do right like you know she if i'm going to change a direction and go to the other side or whatever she's like oh you know or you know very snuggly and and there's definite change in the demeanor so and it's very clear um you know you can see it instantly so that's that's something that that you know you also want to be able to look for there's a change in the eye and there's like hey what what are we going to do Right. Um, so, yeah. So thank you so much. Cause you know, I mean, we could talk for three hours and we'd definitely love to have you go come back because I think people are going to have uh, probably really tactical, practical questions and um, on that. And I think the in-hand work is really important. And again, we could probably talk for, for 10 hours and I know uh, both you and I have been student of that for a very long time. Uh, and we'd love to compare notes on, on in-hand work, but uh um, so I always end the episode with this question and I'd be curious because you've been doing this now for four decades, but what was that aha moment in, in your journey with a horse, um, that you really changed things for you, change a dynamic that you would want to share, uh, with the viewers? Oh my gosh, there's been so many. Um, I guess the, the first, I mean, the first big aha that set me on my path with working with Dominique was the very, um, forgive me, this was so profound. The first time I saw him, I swear to God, I saw invisible webs between the horse and him. And they were so one being, I said, I want that. Wow. 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 That's, it. that's amazing. And, and, I've been, gotten it. It. and I've gotten it. I, that's the beauty is that in many times I've had that exchange between me and my horse where my thought became his. Sometimes his became mine. You got to watch for that. Um, or go with it one or the other. But that connection is incredible. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And you can just see, thank you for sharing that. I know that's very emotional and yeah, I've had, I've had those moments of, I I don't know how you, uh, transcendence, right? Uh, Yeah. They're, 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 they're what, they're what, they're what, they're life. They're, they're, they're the gift that horses give us. There's so many gifts. If we can slow down and listen, the gifts go on and on and on and on. But you have to have that connection. And if you don't have the connection and spend the time with the horse, you know, I, I don't like to go into the la la, oh, you know, that's just, that's not me. I'm, I'm, I do want to ride my horse. I love riding my horse, it's so fun. But you have to, I don't, I don't want to ride a bicycle. I had a motorcycle, I hated that thing. It's down the road. I, I want to ride something I can talk with and communicate with. And, and he listens to me and I listen to him and, and I've had my horse send me pictures. That's when. Yeah. That's, that's when you've really, you've really that's got it. That's when you you have the dance partnership, right? Where you're creating this. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's what my life's about. Wow. wow. More fun than you can imagine. Well, I thank you. I can't a horse person not getting to that. That's the, that's the funny part. I can't imagine a horse person you know, I, I live in Idaho in the mountains and people have hunting horses and they sit out 10 months a year and two months a year, they drag the horse in and they stick a saddle on them and they're going hunting. And, and I just think, my gosh, I'm, I'm sad for them. 
they, they have this incredible being in the pasture next to them and they, they squander it. But that's me. That's, everyone has the right to deal with the horse as long as they do it with benevolence and kindness and not cruelty. You know, horses are very forgiving. They'll be there for you when you want them to be, and you can take advantage of that or not. Yeah, but I think, you know, it's funny because we, we talk a lot. You know, I always hear people say, I want to have a better relationship with the horse or the connection or it's this yeah. or it's that, right? And, you know, and to get, when you do get those moments, they're, they're so profound and they're yeah. emotional and you can't barely express it in words, right? So, um, yeah, so Liz... Thank you so much for oh, being on the show. You. This was an amazing conversation. Yeah. Thank yeah. you very much. Have so a great day. I will. And um, if folks are interested in getting in contact with Liz, um, we'll have some more information on the show notes. Yeah. Um, and Liz will be coming out um, here in the future with uh, some more interactive material for those of you who want um, practical, tactical advice on how to start um, lunging. Uh, and, um, you know, we've, Liz and I have even talked about potentially doing some live Q&A sessions in the future. Yeah. So stay tuned for that. Uh, if you want more information as well and upcoming, you can go ahead and uh, sign up on the Under the Forelock site for newsletter and we'll give you more more info on how to contact Liz and work with her on, on the lunging and other things that we'll have in the future. So thank you again. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Yeah. And um, this has been under the forelock.